morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, Jeanette and Chris can tell you that we're still working out, making sure that we've got everything open and flowing when it comes to the sound, but so far, so good. This is the first morning, really since COVID began, that we are having in-person worship at the same time that we are having our Zoom worship. So this is, a, again, a shift, and we're glad for those that have gathered here in person in the sanctuary, and we're grateful for Alan's live music, and we are happy for those that continue to be with us from different parts of the country in Zoom. So just a quick reminder also that today is communion. So if you do not already have a beverage of some kind or juice, coffee, whatever, water, whatever you would want to use for communion this morning, as well as something small and edible that you can take in as part of your communion element, now's a great time to maybe go grab that. Um, as we go through the announcements for the day. And just to, let's see, catch you up on events here in person in Jackson, we put up pumpkin people yesterday for the first time. <laughs> We've done pumpkin prayers in the past, but now we have pumpkin people. And we have a, a whole flock of um, blank pumpkins awaiting animal faces. So we've been inviting people to take a pumpkin as the, for their children and have their children paint or marker or draw somehow an animal and add it back into our Noah's Ark flock because we're doing Noah's Ark this year. And um, if you look outside, you'll see that it says the Ark is under construction. So Noah's wearing a construction hat and the flock is still being added to, and it's a work in progress, which gives us permission to keep tweaking it as we go. Also, a great big thank you to the crew who came yesterday and worked on our outdoor stairs. We have a number of small but important, well, maybe not so small, projects that are ongoing at the church itself to make it safer and sustainable, and one of those is that the really the treads of the stairs and the railings needed to be replaced. And so several volunteers came yesterday and spent the whole day putting on new treads. The railing is going up next. So right now you can't use the outdoor stairs because it's partway done but not complete. Um, also for those that prepared cookies and pasta salad and barbecue chicken, Sue Kerrigan, and Cindy, and Meg, I think, were the contributors of food to feed the team that was doing the work. Um, so thank you to everybody who spent quite a bit of yesterday in one way or another being of service to the church. We have some other projects coming up, but most of them are going to actually be in the hands of professionals. So this is the one that we could have done by volunteers. Those are the immediate announcements that I can think of. Are there any other announcements for the life of the church that I have not included here? I don't see anything. Now, um, the choir completed and Billy has prepared for us a new song. If we can get the link to the song in time, we're going to share it with you today. So it may be today, it may be next week. So we'll let you know about that as soon as we find out. Oh, I got a message. We're all set. So you're going to be hearing the newest song prepared by the choir, I Dream a World, after the sermon today. And so um, actually, since Billy is here and before we get going, I'm going to have Billy just explain that song, but we're going to use it at the end of the sermon. So, Billy, do you want to unmute and share with us your, your um, introduction to the song, please? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I Dream a World is part of a three-song um, set 
um, that talks about um, equality and social justice, essentially. Um, originally, um, when we were having our talks in the church about social justice and equality back in August and July, thought, hey, this would actually be a really nice fitting song for us to do like we did with I Believe and when COVID pandemic started you know, have a theme with the songs that we were doing. So this song is by a contemporary composer named Rollo Dilworth. Um, and again, he makes it part of a three um, part song series based on poems by Langston Hugh, Hughes. Um, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, I think, yeah, that's how you pronounce his last name, Langston Hughes. Um, and yeah, so this song, like I said, does talk about um, social equality um, and it talks about the, um, freedom and equality of everyone um no matter whatever race you'd be whatever um religion you believe in what gender you are um so when you do listen to this really think about you know the everything that we have been experiencing in the valley and as a country and as a nation together in the past couple of months and just think about those words and how we can use them to help inspire us to think of uh, think of the better for each other, better for every man and every woman and every child so that we can all live an equal and prosperous life together in harmony. Uh, yeah, so when that song does come on, um, I just would like to also say thank you, though, um, to the choir for putting in the hard work for this song. Um, we were talking about this earlier. It was a big challenge for the, um, the choir just because of its complexity. And you'll hear there are some key changes where like the song kind of changes um, how it sounds, the overall um, sound in general. Um, and that was a big challenge for, the, um, for them, but they worked really hard and they made a really, really good um, recording overall. So I'd just like to express my kudos for them and my congratulations for them. Um, this will be the last song that we'll be doing until December for the Christmas performance. But when it comes to the Christmas performance, we're going to have a number of selections that you're absolutely going to love. All right. So hope you guys enjoy the song. All right. Thank you, Billy. And I'm now going to ask that Alan would provide us with centering music so that we can all just take a breath and really be here. And again, if you just arrived, we are having communion today. So I do encourage you, if you don't have your communion elements, to um, make sure you go get those. And for anybody, you know, we're, so we're navigating sound between both the Zoom environment and here in the church. And the only thing that I'm realizing we're going to navigate a little bit will be when people are speaking in Zoom, the folks that are here in the church may not hear it. 
it, it will come through my speakers in the computer, but it may not be that audible to people. So you may hear me do a little bit of repeating or paraphrasing what you shared. And so I just want to share for the people that are here in the church that Billy just introduced the song that we'll be hearing later that was prepared by the choir called We Dream a World. And it is based on, the th on three verses of Langston Hughes' poetry, which again is, you know, it's thinking about equal rights and a just world for all people. And it dovetails beautifully with the themes that we find again and again in the epistles of Paul that we're talking about this week and have been for several weeks. So we are grateful for the choir um, and for the message of a poet named Langston Hughes. And we're going to be focusing on poetry and prayers out of prison today. So it's a perfect uh, segue or, or closing out of the sermon later today. With that, I would like to move us into prayer. And so this is the time when if you have prayer that you would like to share as a congregation, I would love to hear, we want to hear what you want to share and raise it up together. So first, let's begin with any prayers of concern that anyone here might have. And we're going to start out in Zoom. I have one, Gail. I see Meg and Kate. Go ahead. Um, I did learn this week that Mirtha, who is the nurse working for Honduras Hope up in the um, high mountain village of San Jose, has tested positive for COVID-19. She got it from her aunt. And there, luckily, there will be a medical team heading up tomorrow to test everyone up in the village. I believe they were COVID free until now, but she visits people in outlying um, little settlements too. So she's sort of all over the place and she definitely is positive for COVID. So let's please pray for all those people involved. So this is Mirtha who is a nurse in Honduras, yes? Yeah, she's the Honduras Hope nurse right. out in the community. Okay, so the community nurse for Honduras Hope is now testing positive for COVID. And we've been asked to pray for that whole community and for Mirtha in particular, and all those that she supports. And Kate, I see that you also had something you wanted to share. Right, I'd, I'd like to pray for my son and his wife who are um, trying to conceive a child and that God would give them that blessing. Um, it's, it's trying, as they say, it's really hard. So prayers for, for creation itself, and if it is possible that a path should be opened biologically, but that the joy of becoming a family, one way or another, that that path will become possible for Kate's son and daughter-in-law, um, because we have families that have come together in many, many ways in this community, and we know that the challenges of fertility and body can be their own, well, we know they're a challenge. And so we pray that a way will be made through that challenge and for patience and stability and humor uh, and resilience as they're undergoing whatever that might mean for them, but also simply that a family will come together in God's time, if not our time. Other prayers of concern that you might wish to share out loud? Are, are there any here in the congregation? I've got one from Irene. Ah, okay, so um, Irene's niece. <laughs> yeah, uh, Irene's niece um, has come home from university with COVID. So is she with her parents now? Okay, so, so she's with her mother and everyone else has to be separated from them while she goes through her period of recovery, which we hope is what she's aiming for. Other prayers here in the, Alan? Continued, continued prayers for Father Steve from Our Lady of the Mountains who is continuing to care for his parents 
and again for our sister community here in the valley um, as they continue to worship and gather together but without their own particular leader um, they have other wonderful leadership stepping in but it's never quite the same and so we wish him homecoming when that's possible and wellness for himself and his parents in between and prayers of celebration that you might wish to raise up I've got a prayer of celebration from Arden who's sitting here in the sanctuary <laughs> Great. So Arden is celebrating simply arriving in the sanctuary and being here. She was happy for a whole day anticipating this because she couldn't do 915, but she can do 1030. So here she is with us. We have a few wonderful, happy faces here this morning. Um, I, I saw a thumbs up from Deanna. Were you just like doing a thumbs up or do you have something happy to share with us, Deanna? Come on, unmute, say something. <laughs> She's not, she, you're stubborn. You're not going to say, are you? Well, Deanna's looking forward to her wedding <laughs> coming up. Other happinesses that anybody wants to share. I've got um, happiness here with Barbie Brown. Okay, so we'll say prayers for her wellness as she goes in for her hip surgery. Is that what you want us to put? Okay, so we're, we're going to be praying for many people that are having medical procedures, but Barbie wants us to both remember Sue and her upcoming surgery and also, again, gratitude for her care for the crew that we also were thanking who built the stairs yesterday, led by Bob Carper um, with many other willing hands thrown in there. And Wendy's got some happiness for us. Oh. So, so John's, Wendy's, Wendy's sister-in-law, who is John's sister, is coming from Italy to celebrate her 90th birthday with her whole family, and all the kids will be coming up, and everybody will be celebrating. And what's her first name, please? Ruth. So Ruth will be coming from Italy, and there will be lots of happiness here in the valley going on. So uh, prayers for and unhappiness for landmark moments, uh, anniversaries and birthdays and all kinds of things. So we know Tom had a birthday, and I think we sang happy birthday to him last week. How's he doing on the other side of the birthday, Cheryl? Okay. He's there. <laughs> I, 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 I saw a hand going like this. <laughs> come see, come stop. <laughs> um, well, then, I'm going to invite us to pray. Holy God, you hear us. You hear us in our groaning, in our worry, in our poetry, in our prayers as we lift up what we see around us, what we feel within our bodies and our minds and our hearts. We lift up those whose bodies are in need of healing. Sue's hip, Jeanette and Nancy's eyes, Barry's spine and kidney and 
all, his whole body for stabilization from an infection and the complications that's added to a lifelong challenge. For those that are living with Alzheimer's or changes in cognition, for those that have undergone strokes, for a neighbor's son who just was um, visited by an ambulance just this morning, for things that we don't know, we don't know all the answers. And so when we come into your presence, O oh Holy God, with our questions, we lay our questions before you, our uncertainty and our unknowing, and we ask that you will be there with us while we wait for treatment plans and diagnoses and news, whatever it may be. For those who are grieving, for those who are walking towards the change of life where they leave this mortal world and come into your keeping and into your homecoming, and for those who are left behind when such transitions take place. For the places in the world that are literally burning and the places that are flooding and the places that are desperate and dry and thirsty. For the storm clouds and the earthquakes and the people whose lives continue to be challenged and changed by COVID. For the ways that the earth herself calls out and seeks your healing and our compassion and our accountability as her stewards. And in the midst of this crying out, this is where poetry is born, song is born, prayer is born, and the world itself turns into a pageant of brilliant color and bird song and migration, people coming here to see its beauty, birds beginning to head south as they go to warmer climes, and we are grateful that in the midst of suffering itself, you have given us the capacity to reach out with creativity and courage for what we need, the connection we need, and the love we need. Give us your presence and remind us that we are enough and more than enough. If only we will reach for you and for love and each other. We offer you our gratitude. We offer you our lives and our presence and our being. In your name we pray. Amen. And so we migrate from prayer to scripture. And I want to set the stage for you as you listen to the scripture this morning. You will see that at the top of each page, if you're watching in Zoom, you can see the scripture. Otherwise, you'll hear me reading it this morning. This is a letter that was written in prison. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, wrote from prison because he spent several years in prison. He himself was a controversial figure. He was arrested for his troublemaking. And it wasn't a short sentence, it was a long one. And so we focus first on the words of Paul, and then we will think about other words that have been offered to us from prisons in our own day and age, in the context of Paul's words. And so a reading from Philippians, excerpts from Paul's letter. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, 
This will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn. Torn between the two, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in this body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you. Poetry offered from the letter of Paul. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And a second poem from Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So ends the reading. And we thank Alan for the gift of his music as we speak and pray together today. Please be with me in prayer. O oh, holy God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray. Amen. And so I want to take you from the time of Paul into contemporary times and the words of people that have experienced prison in our day and age, some of them as political prisoners, some of them as prisoners in an unjust system, which often has very long sentences that are required for nonviolent crimes or for people that were not guilty or who have now had a defense that would make it possible for them to receive different kinds of help than the kinds of experiences that they had in decades of imprisonment. We think of the great prophets of our times, of Gandhi, of Martin Luther King. We think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose words we will also hear this morning. We think of the children in our own century, Malala Yousafzai, and the young woman from Scandinavia who speaks about the environment the courage that they have to believe that systems can be changed and to critique them. Some people do so at the cost of their very lives. Some people have to do it from behind bars. We are reminded that as people in this nation, we have the right to dissent, to resist, to act through civil disobedience if necessary for change that is not coming for our people. The song that we will hear from the choir is a poem raised up in hope of change and equity for all people. And the letters, the prayers, and the poems that we will hear this morning that are coming from prison are raised up in the same way that systems will change, and that we will live into and believe in the life-transforming, system-transforming, community-transforming presence of Christ and God among us. And so I want to share with you several images 
that will begin to narrate and set the stage for us. For those that are here, I will describe for you what we're seeing, but you'll be able to participate simply by listening. The first image that people who are watching from Zoom can see is the very simple face of a young Jewish man. He was a model that Rembrandt used to paint the face of Christ. And he's an ordinary young man, and he's looking down. And you might describe his emotional state as contemplative, reflective, solemn, perhaps even a little bit sorrowful. And in the next image, we see that one of the things that he's thinking about is his own cousin, John the Baptist, because the next painting shows us the head of John the Baptist presented on a plate. And it's followed by an image that shows Jesus being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is to remind us that Jesus lived under the threat of death throughout his ministry. In point of fact, from his youngest years, when he had to be exiled to Egypt as a child because he was under threat of death first by an evil king, Herod, and later was a danger as seen by, by people within his own faith tradition, but mostly by the Roman government. He was arrested and taken, and in the next image we see him standing before Pontius Pilate. And then in the final image of Christ, the next image, we see him on the cross. His head is hanging, and he has a crown of thorns, and he is dying. He is being executed. So let us recall that everyone who has stood in the prophet's place, anyone who has had the courage to critique, to change the world, and put their bodies on the line even unto death, follows in the way of Christ. He walked there first. And so now we go on to the next image, and we begin to see Paul. In this image, Paul is looking up at the stripes of shadow that are crossing his face because he's in prison, and his arms are in chains. But let us remember that Paul began also in a place of violence. He came into Christianity to begin to help form the, what we now call the Christian movement, although he himself was always a Jew and faithful as a Jew. In the next image, we see that he was actually participating in violence against his own brethren and his own sisters. He was helping to persecute Jews that were beginning to follow Christ. The next image will show yet another scene depicted. This one also shows him, and he's present at the stoning of Stephen, who died, one of the earliest apostles for Christ. And the next image, too, shows us Paul present witnessing violence against his own brothers and sisters. So remember that this man who writes these letters from prison at one time was persecuting the very people to whom he is writing now. He never apologized. He never walked back the violence that he was complicit in because he believed that in that time he was doing what he thought was the right thing to do. But then he had a conversion experience when he saw Christ, the resurrected Christ on the road, and was blinded and lost his sight and had this conversion experience and studied the way of Christ. And he moved from a man who was so absolute in his rules and his faith that he would persecute others to one who would create a way for all to find a place at the table. And he would use the lens of love itself to create change in his time and in his world. And so when we go to the next image, we see the cell in which he was held. This is late in his ministry. He's been a troublemaker over and over again. He had earlier times when he was in prison, but this was an extended sentence. A few years, possibly up to four years, in different prisons, ending in Rome. 
The next two images also show us the prison cell in which he may have spent extended periods of time, but from which he wrote letters. These prisons have been turned into chapels, places of worship. And please, if we go to the next image, we will see an image of Paul writing letters from his prison. In the first few years of the imprisonment, he had pretty terrible conditions. When he went to Rome, because he was considered a citizen of Rome, he had better conditions. They rented an apartment. He still had legs shackled. He was in irons. He couldn't leave, but he could have visitors come to him. And so he worked with people that were representatives of the different churches, and he would send out these letters, some of which have survived and one of which we're focusing on today. And we'll see another example of Paul writing a letter in the next image. And then in the following image, this final image is again Rembrandt showing a pensive Paul with his hand on his chin, thinking as he's got a pen in his hand and he's wondering what to write next in response to the questions and needs of his community. But I hope that what you heard when we read the scripture this morning is not that he was despairing, but that he was hopeful. He even said that he was torn. He felt that his life had been meaningful and purposeful. He was so hopeful in his faith that he was willing and ready to die if that's what was coming, because he too was under a sentence of death. But he had already seen the risen Christ. And he had studied the way of Christ walking in the world. And he believed that he followed in those footsteps. And he identified so completely in his transformation with Christ that he felt that Christ was imprinted on his heart and that he had the mind of Christ. He had had what was almost a death and resurrection experience. He was reborn into a new life, into a new way of being. And when he stayed, he stayed because he felt that that was his call. His call to be of service to the churches that he had helped to found, who were young and struggling and still needed guidance. He was changing the world, one church, one letter, one trip at a time. And now let us turn through these images to the people that in our day and age follow in that same tradition. In the next image, we are going to read a prayer that was written, inspired and supported by a woman named Linda Barkman, who herself was an inmate for 30 years in a California women's prison because she lacked the defense that would have, in point of fact, helped her receive different kinds of help. But while she was there, she was active in the church and in ministry, And she ended up going to Fuller Theological Seminary. She was a valedictorian there and ultimately entered their doctoral program and has begun to do ministry for women in prison and in other places where she finds vulnerable people to be. This is a prayer that she herself prayed from prison. You need to understand, in part, she was in an abusive relationship And the man that she was with killed her child. So the sentence that she served convicted her of killing her own child. And even though perhaps there was a defense, she spent 30 years and everything told her that she was responsible for that death, even though she too was a victim of violence. This is the prayer that she prayed in prison when she couldn't believe that she could be worth anything. You say you can make a new creation out of me, so you have to turn me into somebody I can live with. I don't know what part is good, what part is not. All I know is everybody who has ever loved me or been loved by me is now hurt. And I just don't know what to do. You hear the heartfelt words of Paul saying that he is torn between life and death. This is a woman who is not a political prisoner. 
but she prays out of the reality of our prisons now today, which sometimes punish the victims of systemic injustice. But she speaks for so many people when she prays that prayer because she can't imagine that she is worthy of change or love that will transform her and make meaning out of her life. And yet, because she opens herself through that prayer, she finds that there is meaning, both in prison for the 30 years that she was active in the church ministry, and then her release and her studies and the woman that she has become now. In the next image, you will see some of the artwork that she has helped to support. This is an image of a body thrown back like this, floating up into the light that is streaming through prison windows. It's a striped light, but there is a body with a heart that's pink, a light that is streaming up, and there is hope in this image that's floating away. She didn't paint it, but somebody that she supported painted it. And it seems to capture so wonderfully what she hopes can happen for those even in prison. And in the next image, we see the figure of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a World War II prisoner in the Nazi camps. Because as a minister, he and his church had been asked to validate the crimes that the Nazi regime was committing. And instead, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others secretly met and they plotted to kill Hitler. And their plot was discovered. And so he spent two years in their prison and he was executed there before the war ended. But in that time, he wrote letters. He wrote letters of hope for people that were getting married. He wrote letters about the holidays and his thoughts about death and life. And the prayer that we're going to see here in the next image, in the next few images, is a prayer that he wrote for his fellow prisoners, a morning prayer for them in a dark place. Oh God, early in the morning I cry to you. Help me to pray and to concentrate my thoughts on you. I can't do this alone. In me there's a darkness, but with you there's light. I'm lonely, but you don't leave me. I'm feeble in heart, but with you there's help. I'm restless, but with you there's peace. In me there's bitterness, but with you there's patience. I don't understand your ways, but you know the way for me. Oh, Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you for the rest in the night. I praise and thank you for this new day. I praise and thank you for all your goodness and faithfulness throughout my life. You have granted me many blessings. Now let me also accept what's hard from your hand. You will lay on me no more than I can bear. You make all things work together for good for your children. Lord Jesus Christ, you were poor and in distress, a captive and forsaken as I am. You know all man's troubles. You abide with me when all men fail me. You remember and seek me. It's your will that I should know you and turn to you. Lord, I hear your call and follow. Help me. O oh, Holy Spirit, give me faith that will protect me from despair, from passions, and from vice. Give me such love for God and men as will blot out all hatred and bitterness. Give me the hope that will deliver me from fear and faint-heartedness. Amen. And in the next few images, we will see women that were advocating for social change, women who were suffragettes. Dolores Huerta in the next image, who along with Cesar Chavez, worked for changes for workers and continues to work even now for change in so many different places for so many different women. And in the next image, we see Gandhi standing behind prison, also advocating nonviolence, but also advocating dissent, 
resistance, and change. And here in the next image is the prayer that he offers us. The real way to pray is to do in his name some little service to those who are less fortunate than ourselves. And when we show the spirit of service in daily life, unbelieving neighbors will begin to believe in God. And I close us out with images of Martin Luther King and his challenge to all of us written into his letter from a Birmingham jail. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? Jesus Christ was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness. Perhaps the nation and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. That was our final image. Let us end thinking about those words that came out of prison and say thanks be to God. Amen. And now I turn us towards the beautiful voices of our choir who raise up in hope the words of Langston Hughes, we dream a world.
feel free to clap. Yay! You can unmute yourselves and clap too so they can hear more applause. Beautiful. They Heaven worked so hard on that. Go ahead, go ahead. Heavenly. <laughs> Beautiful. Awesome. And thank you to Langston Hughes, who wrote poetry out of his time and his place that becomes the song that we sing now. That is a voice lifted up, light oh. and darkness and hope. Go ahead, Billy. No, sorry. <laughs> Lance, I didn't mean to talk over you. I'm sorry. No worries. It's all good. All right. Um, we're going to move to communion just making sure i've got my right order here don't want to forget offering yeah we're going to do the offering first and then communion and so brothers and sisters we ask that you will along with us be faithful people as we walk the way together um, we've made a promise to each other, and we ask that you will remember to think of the church, to make an offering, whether it is through jxncc.org or by envelope or in person if you're here. There's a little basket up here that you're more than welcome to place your offering in. Um, but if you're if you're on home, Put out that little glass and remember to put your pledge in the little glass and keep up the other ways that we are, are accountable to each other and uphold our promises to each other as a faith community and to the larger world. And then I also invite you at this time one more time if you need to get up and go grab something for communion this is the perfect time to do it So if you happen to be in our sanctuary, you may hear a little bit of peeling and unpackaging because we have um, the communion elements with us and we'll be partaking of those in just a moment. We, we have special little ones that are completely safe. Everyone is its own, in its own little container that no one else has touched so we can do this safely while we're together. But I invite you now before we partake of those elements, to participate with us all together in the prayer of confession. And I would ask that you would unmute. And we will put up on the screen now that prayer of confession. But for those that are here in the congregation, the response to each, re each reading is, forgive our community, O God. So if you'll just say that with everyone else, you too will be participating. Merciful God, for failing to love each other because of politics, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, race, faith, abledness, income, homelessness, age, education, mental health, sobriety, fitness, and other ways we differ from each other. Forgive yes. our community, yes. oh God. For the appalling silence of your good people, forgive our community. For the isolation, exile, pain, suffering, even death that others endure when we do not speak and act to build up your kingdom here on earth, 
forgive, forgive our community, our community. Oh, God. for failing to respect the dignity and worth of all persons forgive, forgive our community, our community. Oh, God. Oh, God. for failing to understand that you require justice mercy and humility Forgive, forgive our community, our community. Oh, God. for failing to hear the cries of our neighbors who continue to hurt. Forgive, forgive our community, our community. Oh, God. Oh, God. Gracious, gracious God. God. Free us Free from dark darkness and shackles of othering that, that prevent that persons in our community, in our community fully from living fully, fully and through the guidance, the guidance of your spirit. Of your spirit. Help, Help us, us learn, learn to live, live as sisters, sisters and brothers, and brothers of the family of God, God in loving love of this community, one with another. another. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and you can mute yourselves now. And at this time, let us say a blessing over the sacramental elements. Oh, holy God, we ask that you will be present at every table that is laid before you today, as you will be present in the life of every person that has gathered within your presence today. And that like the bread we break and the wine that we pour out or the juice or the beverages we pour out, you will break open our hearts and our minds that love may flow from you into us, into this community, this body of yours, which is all of us, becoming your love here on earth. And may it flow through us out into the greater world, which is your greater body. We ask that you will be present this morning among us. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, does everybody have their elements ready? And does anybody need help with their elements? The, the, the bread is the little disc on top. It's right inside the little lid. Yes, we're going to do a quick demonstration for everybody of our fancy little cups here. So here you go. See, this is the cup we have. And the little white disc on top is the bread. So if you peel up this little fancy tab, be careful. That's the bread. So just get the bread first if you can. Jean, would you like me to do this one for you? In fact, you can take this one, okay? So, Jean, here's bread. You want it? Okay. And here we find the bread of life. And we're helping each other. On the night before Christ was arrested and taken to begin the trials that would take him into prison, he asked that those that were with him would break bread and that in the future, as they became his body, that they would remember and when they broke bread together again, that they would do so in remembrance of him. Take, eat, and do so in remembrance of the one that leads us on the way. And brothers and sisters, if you have one of these cute little cups, if you peel up this little metallic tab, there is juice inside. Just be very careful that it doesn't splash all over you. So you have such pretty clothes. Don't get it on yourself. Or if you have a cup at home, prepare your cup. 
think everybody is set. Is everybody set? On the same night that Christ washed the feet of those who loved him and that he broke the bread, he also poured himself and his love into their lives as he poured the juice and the wine into their cups. And he asked him, he asked those who loved him, when they took of their cups to do so in remembrance of his love poured out for all of us. Take and drink. And so, brothers and sisters, let us now pray together a prayer of thanksgiving. You'll find the words on your screen. And for those who are gathered here, um, we will say it for you. <laughs> so simply be in prayer. Thank you for sharing your life with us, for opening your way to us, for sending your spirit to us that we may be reminded that the time is always ripe to do right. Inspire us, O oh God, to imagine the promised land of justice and mercy. The time is always ripe to do right. Teach us, O oh God, to be willing co workers with you. The time is always ripe to do right. Give us courage, O oh God, oh God, to search, search ourselves. The time is always ripe to do right. Call us, O oh God, God, to move to with move a sense of great urgency, urgency for the right for the time, time is now. now. Amen. I was going to have us sing a congregational song, but I believe I'm going to have us sing the benediction as our closing song so that we can try to be honorable of honoring people's time commitments. So we will go directly to the benediction, which, thank you, my wonderful husband is prepared for us. And we will listen to um, the leadership by Bob and Alan as recorded, and you can mute yourselves and sing along. But the people here in the sanctuary can listen only, no congregational singing. That's the downside to this. <laughs> Hear me? Hopefully, you heard me through communion. Did you hear me through communion?
Okay. <laughs> you guys are going to have to like shout and wave if something like that happens and you can't hear me. Um, it's hard to resist singing the, these songs that we know and love. So the people that are here today sitting in the sanctuary, there is some humming going on, but just <laughs> we're all learning this new way that we are safe together. But it is well worth it just to be in each other's company. And so let's have Alan share with us some transitional music, and then we can chat for a few minutes, and Alan will close us out.